move on. Let's do the spelling strategy. Are you ready to do the spelling strategy? Yes. Yes, do the spelling strategy. Spelling strategy is real easy. Mine is um, <clears throat> slightly different than what Robert Diltz uh, came out with originally. Um, it's not about one is better than the other. It's just mine's a little bit different. So the very first thing that I want the person to do to, to I want them to have the word stored in, the, in their visual field, if you will. So I want them to visualize the word. Now, be careful. One, one real thing you want to be careful. Terminology was, varies from person to person. If you say to some people, make a picture of this word or visualize this word, they will, they'll say, I, I don't know how to make a picture. So if you notice that somebody is resisting doing what you're asking them to do, listen to their terminology and use their terminology. You might say things, well, remember what this word looks like. Or do you have a memory of what that, can you look at, look at a word and then turn away and have a memory of what it looks like? Can you image the word? Can you, visualize will work for some people. A part of the reason for that in my experience is there's a lot of people out there that, that think um, when I say make a picture of this artwork right here and then close your eyes and describe it to me, they say, well, when I close my eyes, everything goes away. It's blank and, or it's black. And what, what they're basically saying is I can't see in my internal eye as vividly as I can out here. So they deny the fact that they have any pictures at all on the inside. So you've got to retrain them to make them aware of the internal images that they have. So some of the tricks that I use are like this. I would say, if that door opened and your best friend or your mom or dad or somebody walked through it without saying a word, would you recognize them? And of course the answer is always yes. You can't do that without having an internal image of what they look like. Okay? Um, do you know, without looking in the mirror, do you know what you look like? Do you remember what you wore yesterday morning? Sometimes they'll go auditory on you with that one. So anything to get them aware uh, of their mental imagery. Do you, know what, um, do you know what your dog looks like? If you were to put your dog on this table, can show me how tall he would be? Where would the tail be and would you pet him on the head? You know, anything to kind of to get them to go, oh, that's what you mean about a picture. Well, that's what you mean about a, a self or an image inside the mind. Okay? So just be real careful if, and if they resist you, the way I think about it, it's not that they can't do it. The first thing is they may not be aware that they can do it. And you just have to find where they naturally do it and then you know, show them how to do it in the context that you want them to do it in. Now, when they visualize the word, I like, I like for them to either see it externally or write it down. Okay? And what I like for them to do is to break it down into um, syllables. The, the syllables as it sounds, just like they do in the dictionary. Not, not the phonetic way, but the way that it, way it looks. So, for example, with the word student. I usually will underline part of it, the, the syllables like this, and just say, now, big words are just little syllables put together. So make an image of stew. Remember what stew looks like, whatever way you want to say this. Remember what dent looks like. Okay. Once they say they've got it, then I may turn the paper over and say, now, can you, can you remember what stew looks like? Can you remember what dent looks like? When they say they can, then I, I'll, do it, I'll do it the slow way or the fast way, depending upon how fast I think they are. I'll say, okay, let's take dent. What's the last letter? All of you. It's the last letter. And right before that? Right before that? Before that? Okay, now let's go to stew. What's the last letter of stew? U. 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 And I was like, great, you did well. Man, that's super. You didn't know you could do that, did you? And now let's do it this way. Let's take stew and dent, and I want you to start over here at the end. I just want you to scroll across. So the last letter is? Super, way to go. And I usually have some anchor that I, that I set up with them. Go to way to go, you know, and give them a lot of that good supportive feedback that you know they they are something special. And I may do that with um, <clears throat> depending upon their age. 
I may do it with several words. Um, and I usually will go up, maybe do it two or three or four times uh, with, with, do it first with words that they know, and then I'll start moving into words that they don't know at their age level, whatever that may be. Okay? So you guys are ready for my favorite word, aren't you? <laughs> let's do, <clears throat> let's see, where do I have, let's, let's do it on this one. How you spell Albuquerque is like this. It's A-L-B-U-Q-U-E-R-Q-U-E. -E. Whoops. If you can read my handwriting. So it's al b u k e r k e. This is out. This is a U. This is a U. That's a U. That's supposed to be an E. All right? Sorry. So, everybody make sure that you have, I'm going to turn this over here in a minute. So make sure you know what owl looks like. Make sure you know what ba looks like. Make sure you know what cur looks like. That's an R, by the way. It helps if I type them out, by the way. Make sure you know what key looks like. Notice that key doesn't sound like it looks. Q. Q U E. All right. Everybody got it. Now I'm going to show you when I have students that I think that I, I really want to go after their self-esteem and, and go after their beliefs that they can't learn. I won't necessarily do it syllable by syllable like I did the first time. We'll do it this way. We're going, to just, we're going to put it up in the air and then scroll across. So it's almost like everybody remember Al, what it looks like, Ba, Ker, Key. Last letter is? Super, give yourself a hand, yay. Now, all that tells me and it tells you is that you have an excellent picture in your mind's eye, a high quality picture in your mind's eye, and that's the first thing I need. We want to make sure that you have it stored visually. We want to make sure that you have it stored visually really well. Once you have that, now we go to the retrieval system. While, while, let me say it one more time, while, Looking at the image of the word, sound it out. So here was Al, Al, <laughs> you said. Albuquerque. Very good. And what that does is attach the sound to the image and at the neurological level. Now to make sure that you have all the letters in there right, now spell it correctly. So hold that picture in your mind's eye. What's the, start over here. What's the first letter? Very good. Just have a hand. That's not, that's not an easy word to learn, by the way. It's, I'd say 98% of the population of the United States can't spell that thing, either frontwards or frontwards, let alone backwards, by the way. Now, to drop it into long term, what you need to do, you don't have to go back and spell it backwards anymore unless somehow you lose the image or the image starts getting fuzzy or something like this. Now you just practice this step right here. I'm sorry, three and four. You, you, know, you, you pull up the image, you say, okay, Albuquerque, and as soon as you say Albuquerque, hopefully the image pops into your mind, and then you just spell it frontwards. Okay? Is that fairly simple? Mm -hmm. Fairly efficient. You're, you're doing it in two systems, and it seems to work. I would suggest that you practice over time, six to eight times. Some of you may not need that much time, much practice. Some of you may. Some of you may need more than that. So what I do with students is I'll go on and maybe I'll do another word. If I want to really go after their, um, their belief system about themselves, I have another favorite word that I, that I do, and it's Saskatchewan. It's in, favor, in honor of you from Canada. I was up in Canada working with some kids with ADD one, one year, and this kid was wanting to learn, know how to learn the provinces. So he came up with this province of Saskatchewan, and I said, man, I don't know how to spell Saskatchewan. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
they taught me how to spell it, and it, you know, when you pop that out in an, in an American kid, they go, what? <laughs> and, uh, and they think they can't spell it, but actually it's real easy to spell. So let me give you one more. Let's put it, let's put it on the bottom of this one. Then. So it's S-A-S-K-A-T, spell funny. Uh, it's got chew, chew, H-E-W, C-H-E-W, A-N. So sass, cat spell funny, chew. See, when it has words within words, it's easy. And then an, that's an A-N. Okay. So everybody remember what sass looks like? Remember what cat looks like? Remember what chew looks like? Remember what an looks like? Everybody got it? By the way, when I'm working with a kid, if they go, man, I'm having trouble with, with one of these, like, kind of like Perla did, I stop and I get them to make it bigger, make it stand out, change the color, something, anything to make it stand out. And if they need to take another look at it, like if I, if I say, okay, and cover it up, and you're going to get a picture of it. So I start saying, okay, here's sass, cat, chew, and can you remember all that? And they say, well, chew is not very... <coughs> I said, okay, go back and take a look at it. I mean, there's no failure. There's only feedback. Okay? So. I've got to start paper in the wall. I'm getting too many sheets up here. So I, <laughs> they're up there. So here we go. The spelling strategy goes like this. You image it. <clears throat> Sass, cat, chew, un. And then you take the last... Letter over here. What's it? N-A-W-E-H-C-T-A-K-S-A-S. Very good. Give yourself a hand. Way to go. Now, what does that spell? Spell it frontwards. feel like a cheerleader up here or something like that. Way to go. All right. Now, all you, and then, uh, again, you just do it over time. So practice over time. So all together, Albuquerque. A-L-B-U-Q-U-E-R-Q-U-E. Very good. Saskatchewan. All right, you guys made a hundred on that spelling test. Way to go. Now, any questions about this? Are you ready to go practice this for a little bit? Mm -hmm. I, have, I have a question. Okay. Um, I noticed that, um, that as I, and, and I'm, I spell very well, um, one thing I noticed that I do, though, is I count also while I'm spelling. But that's an auditory deal. Um, is that you count while you're I spelling? Count while, yeah, because I, I, it's, it's patterning. Like, like I, it's part of my retrieval. So I am just think it's interesting, and I want to know if it's getting in my way. I don't know what you mean by you count when you're... Um, to, it's like a check to make sure that um, I got all the letters. So it's like you count the number of syllables in the word? No, or in the amount of letters in the syllable. The amount of letters in the syllable? Or in the, or in the letters in the words. And it happens like simultaneously while I'm seeing it. Sure. Does it, does that get, does it then you say you're an excellent spelling? An excellent spelling. <laughs> <laughs> then I'd say it probably doesn't get in your way. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, ma'am. If you have a word with more than three syllables, and so um, there's more than one of the middle syllables you have trouble with, like Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. it's not just a chew, it's a cat chew that you have trouble mm -hmm. with. So would you do each one and large each one separately and then Whatever, and then put them together. How would you handle that? Where there's more than these four syllables, and you have a problem with the two or more. Okay. Let me show you. On, um, like a lot of times with Albuquerque, it's the curve that they have trouble with. So what I want them to do is, as they're as they're looking at this, I want in their mind <coughs> that curve. Let's do it this way, Albuquerque. I want that curve to almost jump out at them as they get to it. And so it's like. You, you show them a piece of paper, I want Kerr to go Q-U-E-R. And once you say, make it jump out at you, and your eyes go back and they kind of withdraw like this, you can watch them, you know, they'll, they'll go E-U-Q-R, E-U-Q. You know, and, 
you know that you got them when they're doing that <laughs> type of thing, real kinesthetic response. Different colors work. I mean, one of the things that causes um, some people to have trouble with spelling, I think I mentioned this yesterday, is that they have, they're creative. They have, you know, well, it could be spelled this way, this way, this way, this way. Well, I don't know which one is right. So they have four different spellings of a word in their mind's eye. So one of the ways to overcome that is to have them pick their favorite color. Now, purple is my favorite color. Other people will pick pink and red and all sorts of things, but have them pick a color that they don't normally see in print. When they're learning their spelling words, let's say they use purple, have them image it in purple and, and then recall it in purple. If their mind has only seen it spelled correctly in purple, then when they start that A, L, B, U, Q, E, R, the rest of it stays in purple, it's going to be correct because their mind hasn't seen it in purple any other way. Yeah, works, works well. Um, I, um, I don't know whether this is a good time to ask the same question that I had asked earlier. It's about quantity of inputting. So in a week, a kid has 20 spelling words okay. to know. This is a good time. Okay, so how, what strategy do I give them for, practice, for doing the spelling words? In Oklahoma, it varies sometimes place to place, but usually what they will do is either give a list of 20 spelling words out on Friday or Monday. Let's, let's suppose it's on Monday. That's probably the most common time. And then there's the test is Friday. And the test is usually on Friday, and they usually have a practice test on Thursday. Okay? So what I say to do, so they, mean they have three days that they get to learn the spelling words. I say pick... If there's 20 of them, pick the seven hardest ones on Monday. And if the parents working with them, I say, okay, when you first get the spelling words, uh, do the seven hardest and, and you know, let them go through this the spelling strategy. And then maybe you do that before dinner. And then after dinner, just do a little quiz. I'm gonna spell Albuquerque, spell Saskatchewan, spell, you know, and you just kind of give them a little quiz. Maybe right before they go to bed, you go back and go over those seven. Maybe when you get up the next morning while they're doing the, their breakfast, you do those seven again. The idea is you want more time to practice the ones that are the hardest. When they come home the next night, you take the next hardest six or whatever it may be, and you do the same thing all over again, and you practice the, the first seven a couple of times so that you get more practice on that. And then on Wednesday, you do the, the remaining ones, and you practice the second group, and you practice the third group. Usually when they take the practice test on, um, on Thursday, a lot of schools, teachers, if you make 100 or do really well on the, the practice test on Thursday, you don't have to take it on Friday. And many times they will, they will do that. So, hmm? so I have another I have an input question. Um, does it matter? I mean, to me it would matter, so I'm asking you because you've done this a ton. Um, let's say I'm teaching second and third graders spelling. Mm -hmm. Do I want to be having the words big and up to show them the first time if I'm wanting to do spelling with a whole class or even with an individual? Does it, I mean, it would seem to me it wouldn't be useful to have it right down here. If no, I would. Sitting on a desk, that would be like stick it in their kinesthetic, would be a very useful. I'd say most teachers, if, if I was doing it, I'd either have them with a piece of paper and have it up like this, or I would write it on a chalkboard, you know, up, not down. So how about with like working with an individual child or sitting at a desk? It seems to me that they're that doesn't look like it would be. Like, you hold it up. Just have it this yeah. Way. So it is while they're taking it in, just hold well, it up. Exactly. Okay. Right. Great. <clears throat> All right. Let's get you active. Remember, I told you I got to get you active after lunch, right? <clears throat> so here's what I want you to do. <clears throat> I want you to um, pair up with another person. I want you to come up with. Um, four words that they don't know how to spell. And so you'll do this in this fashion. So like, um, yeah, but, but we have to know how to spell, right? <laughs> yes, you have to know how to spell. Does it do you have like a, like a point of addiction? <laughs> we, we, I do have a dictionary and I'll bring it out here in a minute, but you've got, you got lots of words in your manual that some people won't know how to spell, or you can just be creative. Now, I want, I want some words to have a, a certain amount of difficulty. So it's like, um, um, so you might give them a couple that you know, are fairly easy to learn, but I want at least one complex one or long one or something like this so that they have multiple, syllable, multiple syllables to do, okay? And don't try to get tricky with them. Don't try to find the ones that are the hardest ones there are out there. This is about if they don't know how to spell it then they, they practice this particular strategy. And we write them down. Do what? We write them down. Uh, you can write them down. I'll tell you another 
thing that you can do. What page is that on? Yeah, I, I'll make this even easier on you because I've already got some spelling words in there for you. Page 17. Page 17 is, um, here, here's the way I'd want you to do it. One, two, three, four, five, six. There's six words in here. So I want one of you to do the first three to teach the first three to the other person. And then I want the other person to teach the second three to, to you. So you just do three. All right? And if you get through in time, notice there's an extra credit if you learn how to spell. <laughs> so, <laughs> you get extra credit if you can spell supercalifragilisticexpialidocious backwards. Oh, let me tell you the story about that. I, the, the same kids that I worked with with Saskatchewan, doing a brother to brother team. One was uh, 14 years old and one was 12. And the 12 year old had ADHD big time. He was on the roof of the house actually. And um, <clears throat> I was working with his older brother and I was teaching him you know, all this stuff and, and he was just really turned on. The little brother finally came in and he saw his brother doing this and said, what are you doing? And the older brother said, man, get out of here. You know, this is good stuff. And so the kid just sat there and watched and he figured out that we were spelling words backwards. And so after a while, I looked over at him, and he was sitting like right there in front of me, and his brother was over here. And I looked at him, and he's going like that. <laughs> he said, so what are you doing? He said, I'm seeing if I can spell supercapofragilisticexpialidocious backwards. And I went, uh oh. <laughs> I don't even know how to spell it frontwards, you know. And so mother did know how to spell it frontwards, and so we wrote it out on a piece of paper, and he spelled it right, backwards. And here's this 12-year-old that was a had fallen through the cracks of the, of the school system, by the way, and he could visualize that well, and nobody was utilizing his ability to visualize that well. Yeah. So, and then one day, I'm not going to, don't test me on this right now, but one day I was, on, I was on a treadmill, and when you're on a treadmill, it's just real boring stuff, you know. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm going to practice that. So I projected that out there and got to where I could spell it frontwards and backwards. So give yourself a, a bonus if you can do that. So pick another person. This ought to be real quick. Uh, test each other. So like if, if I do three with Anwar and then she comes back and do, does three with me, then I go, okay, spell this one, spell this one, spell this one. And then after she gets through being tested, then she comes back and tests me. Okay. You get, uh, you get ten minutes. Ten minutes. <laughs> All right. So do you feel like world-class spellers ready for a spelling bee? Yes! <laughs> I'll tell you, when, when uh, I first started doing this, I had many students that could visualize these words far better than I could. You know, I was just hanging on by the <laughs> fingernails and trying to stay with them sometimes. And the more I've done it, the more, um, the easier it is. Um, so a lot of it is getting, first of all, getting aware of it and then getting used to it and then just practicing until it becomes second nature. A couple of tips with your students. Um, you know, for those of students that are having trouble visualizing or they need to develop it, I highly recommend that they do this with, you know, lots of, lots of spelling words. And that the more they do this, the better off they're going to be. Another uh, little game that I will get the parents and the, and the student to play is um, maybe they're driving down the street and they see a billboard coming up on the side and maybe there's a big telephone number on it or maybe there's the, a name on there or some word on there. And so maybe the mother says, you know, that word hotel, get an image of that hotel. And by this time they're almost by it. So what, what that does is force the child to look at the billboard and take a picture of it and then hold it while he <laughs> spells it backwards. And then of course the child gets to do it with the parent too. And of course, then they get into this game of who can do it better, and then I'm I'm the winner because now they're they're really working at it, you know. Um, because a lot of times, what happens with with some people is that they they work at it too hard, and they slip into an auditory strategy. They're, they they know they're supposed to make a picture of it, but they look at it and they're actually sitting there spelling it out in their mind. And I don't want that. I want I want to circumvent that. I want to interrupt that pattern. 
So to um, have them look at something, take a picture of it, and then look, at, look aside and hold that picture in their mind is one of the sub-skills that I try to develop. And I think I mentioned a while ago that, or earlier that sometimes I will just write a word on, I have one of those little uh, slates in my office. So you just write a word on the slate, hold the slate up, and take it away, and then you do it faster and faster so that they have to take a picture faster and faster and hold that picture. Um, and either one of those will work. The computer program that I, that I found that will just literally do random words that don't have any meaning whatsoever, I mean random uh, letters, excuse me. And I think you can put in there from, I don't know how high it goes, but like four to six to eight uh, letters. Or you can do uh, numbers. And it, you can program it to you know, flash it for one second, five seconds, however long you want to. And then they have to reproduce it down at the bottom of the screen. <coughs> There's an old, um, before computers, one of the um, companies that had a, um, I don't know what they were doing this for, but they, had, I guess vocabulary, they had a little machine that they had that had a, a little flipper on it. And so the, it was designed, they had maybe 20 words on a sheet of, on a card that you would stick down in it. And then they, they had you flip this thing and it would just you know, open the shutter and release it real fast. And you could regulate how much time they got to see it. And so it was pre-computer. So this idea has been around a long time. Spelling the word backwards hasn't, at least not that I know of, anyway. Um, one humorous story, because <clears throat> um, so, some people say, well, you can't do this with really young children. And my, my comment is, young children can do it better than we can. Yes. <laughs> you know? um, my, uh, again, I had two brothers. And again, they were 14 and 12 years of age. And I was working with them. And it's in the summertime. And um, the mother couldn't find a babysitter, and so they had a six-year-old little girl, a little cute little girl. And so she came in, and she was just sitting there watching me work with her, her brothers. <clears throat> so we did the, did the assessment, did the spelling strategy with the Albuquerque and stuff like that. Next week when they came in, and I went up to the um, office where the secretary is to get in the, re the reception room to get them, I walked into the reception room, and this little girl jumped up and said, I can spell Albuquerque. <laughs> and I said, you can? She said, yeah. And I said, spell it for me. And she said, A-L-B-U-Q-U-E-R-Q-U-E. And my secretary said, they're going, what? <laughs> and I said, can you spell it backwards? She said, yep. I said, okay. She said, E-U-Q-R-E-U-Q-L-A, oh, U-B-L-A. And then my secretary did fall out of her chair. <laughs> so it's a, it's a real fun strategy, and kids love it. I mean, some parents think you can't do that, but when the kids can do things like this, it just really um, it not only boosts their morale, but it boosts their self-esteem, boosts their confidence, and, and this comes later in the training, but I use this opportunity to start to break down their limiting beliefs. So I, I will say things like this, and I'll explain this later on while it works, but once they can take Albuquerque and spell it backwards, I'll say things like, this lets me know that there's nothing wrong with your mind and you're, that you can do really well in school if you want to do really well in school. And what I'm going to do now is teach you how to use your mind in a way that will work really well because nobody's ever got around to teaching you how to learn before. Now I'm going to teach you how to learn so that you can be the kind of student that you want to be in school. Now let me show you what I'm doing, come to think of it. Can you all see the logical levels? Now listen, listen to my language pattern because this is one of the things that makes what I do so transforming. I'm going to, um, I'm literally going to take them and run them up and down the logical levels with my words. See if you can track it. Oh, you spelled Albuquerque frontwards and backwards. That's really good. I bet you didn't believe that you could do that, did you? Now that I, I've seen you do that, that lets me know that you're the kind of student that can really do well in school whenever you learn how to learn, like, because nobody's ever taught you how. So when I teach you how to learn, you'll be able to do all those things in school that they ask you to do. Won't your parents and won't your peers be proud of you because you now can do things that they never learned how to do before? You can now learn to value school and believe in yourself as a student even more than you did before. Did y'all track that? What that does is the linguistically integrate them, every time I have a little deal like this, I mean, it starts, it starts crumbling their beliefs. If they came in there believing, you know, I can't learn, and you know, I can't do well in school, and then you give them a counterexample to that belief, which is what you're doing, 
then you take that belief and you start working up and down the logical levels, you're just tearing that old belief that they have apart that they can't learn. And it's really, really powerful. And you're going to learn how to do that. Yeah. Okay, any last minute comments before we move on? Yes. Okay. Uh, real quick thing. Uh, that's true. brought out a very important point. I think it was a very good one. He, he said, can I close my eyes to visualize? He said, absolutely. Sometimes by closing our eyes, it shuts out the external distractions so we can focus on our images. And if you've got kids or anybody that wants to close their eyes to help visualize, by all means, it's a very important thing. Absolutely. Yes? Um, our kids in school, they have to memorize three things. Spelling, uh, poetry, they have to memorize, and the uh, Quran, they ha we have to memorize. Can poetry and the religious... Hang, hang on, we're not there yet. We're, we're not to that kind of learning yet. So, uh, okay, Ask that question later on. Right now, there's, there's, as far as I'm concerned, there's, there's five survival strategies for school. If you can do these five things, you can survive school. You might even be able to thrive in school. If you can memorize things, there's three things that we force them to memorize. One is spelling words, one are the math facts, and one are just facts and data. You know, they have to remember, you know, in 1982, blah, 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 did this, and they, you know, all that stuff. And we give them study sheets to memorize that. Then they have to be able to read with comprehension. They have to be able to read and remember what they read. And as I mentioned yesterday, we don't get around to teaching them that. So you and I are going to devise and come up with a reading comprehension strategy. In order for them to be able to read with comprehension, they have to have a different way for most people to learn vocabulary words. They have to, they have to develop a visual uh, reading vocabulary because I'm going to want them to, to visually read. So if they can do those five things, then I predict that they can do anything at school that they want to do. There are other strategies out there, but those are the five basic ones. So we're going to be getting most of those today. This includes um, poetry? We can cover that if you want to. Because it's very crucial to us. Poetry and the Quran is very crucial. They have to, in order to pass their Arabic and their religious class, they have to memorize it and say it exactly. Is there a reason that they require that to be so rigorous? Yes, it is very much because to know their literature and to know their religion. And this is two things that is required. Okay. Now, let me, let me repeat what she's saying because she was kind of soft-spoken on that. They have, to, they have to be able to memorize poetry and memorize the Quran? Is that the Quran, yes. The Quran. And they have to be able to do it verbatim. Now, and this is not being critical of, of anybody. What do you think that seduces the students into? What kind of learning strategy? Auditory. You say memorize this. Most people will go right into saying it over and over and over again. An example of that here. Um, one, some time ago, I had uh, just bang, 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 four law students come to see me. They, they were, didn't know each other. They just all of a sudden came in this one about a month or six weeks apart. And they were all straight-A students in college, but when they hit law school, they started struggling. And so I do an assessment. I have them come in and bring the books, and I do the assessment, and then I do what I can. And each of these cases, they were being seduced out of their visual learning strategies that they had in college because of the letter of the law. I mean, that, you know, that they think that law is, and they thought they needed to know um, by verse and you know, everything that the law said. Um, when I showed them how to visualize law, it's just like, they, well, gee, that makes it so easy. Like, right, you know, because you're a visual learner. So, so many times in our schools, the way we present material and the way we, the expectations that we have of students really almost tricks them into going into an auditory strategy. Another example is geometry. I mean, I'm an old math teacher. And what we used to say, what I used to say to my students and other math teachers would say when they're in geometry is that you need to know the postulates and the axioms and the theorems. 
So memorize as we get them, as we get them, the postulates and the axioms and the theories. Well, the word memorize goes into a, a kid's head, and I, don't, and I don't know why, and they, they slip into this auditory strategy. When I show them how to do it visually, using the vocabulary strategy, it makes it just as easy as it can possibly be. So we'll work on that. I'm, I'm not a, a poet, so I'm <laughs> not real sure what I can do, but I will give you some strategies that I think I can, that what I would suggest anyway. But the verbatim thing is, um, is a tricky little thing that can do weird things with people's minds. So, yes, Janet. Um, the uh, memorizing of poetry would be very closely related to what I've been ex uh, experimenting with students. Memorizing song texts in foreign language, and they don't even know the language. And right. what I did was I basically chunked up the spelling strategy to where instead of uh, getting a visual picture of the random assortment of letters, right. they were getting a visual picture of this to them, random assortment of words, right. bringing it into lines, and it worked quite well. Yeah. The meaning they would put with later as they got a text, but I just experimented with that, and they were able to make pictures, line mm -hmm. by line, of a song text, which basically is a poem, mm -hmm. and memorize it that way, to the point that I had three students that were able to recite it from the last word backwards to the book. Well. Yeah, and by the way, if um, uh, sometimes when I'm, I do like classes in, in a local Votech and just as a marketing deal, and I have a two-night class called Enhancing Memory. And so one of the things that I do is teach them a lot of these techniques about visualization, et cetera, and, and that little exercise you did this morning where you were spelling words backwards and spelling telephone numbers backwards and stuff like this, what I did was um, move them on up to social security numbers and then I'd move them up to short sentences, and then I'd move them up to longer sentences. So that somebody would say a sentence to them, they would print it out in their mind's eye, and then have to say the words backwards, which is just more development of the visualization, of the ability to visualize.